The Man of Steel's work is never done. Father, superhero, defender, and oh so much more. But when old allies become new enemies and old wounds come back to haunt Superman, what'll happen next? Well, let's hop into the pages of Action Comics issue number 1048 and find out together, shall we? So then, as we rejoin this arc, we once again check back in with Metallo over on Strikers Island. It seems that Luthor did indeed give Corbin a brand new body, despite him not asking for it. Lex's offer still stands for Metallo, come work for me, fight Superman, and we'll kick off all these damn dirty war worlders. But once again, Corbin is not convinced, and why shouldn't he? In an excellent bit of writing, Metallo says that there really is no reason for him to join Lex, even if he does give him a big, new, stronger body. History has shown time and time again, every time Luthor fights Superman, he loses, which means Metallo would lose, and well, he doesn't want to do that anymore. He's taken himself off the board. Luthor freaks the hell out, he's not used to getting so verbally slapped around by the likes of John Corbin. Nor is he used to finding a person who he can't just simply buy. Lex quickly regains his composure and then starts making veiled threats against Corbin's sister who visits him every Sunday. So yeah, this is most definitely not the end of their conversation. Now at the other end of the book, we see Lois is taking the twins. Those two young Falasian refugees that Superman had rescued from Warworld brother and sister Osul and Otho to the Metropolis Zoo for the day so that they can better get acclimated to life on planet Earth. Of course, their years of suffering in War World comes out in unexpected ways. A zoo, you say? Is this where they punish animals and shame them? Or is this a place where Earthling families go to hunt animals for sports? But of course, no trip to learn about the beauty and worth of humanity and the planet Earth would be complete without meeting one Bibbo Babowski, Superman's biggest fan, don't you know? He's agreed to help Lois out with the kids today, and by help, I of course mean give them a bunch of ice cream to eat. Ah, Bibbo, you big, beautiful simpleton. Never change. I love that Philip Kennedy Johnson is really playing around and having some fun with Superman's extended cast of characters. In fact, as we hear in Superman's own internal monologue, he talks about how there used to be a time in his life when he felt so alone, so cut off from everyone else, and yet now, here at this point in his life, he truly does feel like the happiest person in the world with an adopted family, an adopted world, so many friends. And now all he wants to try and do is fight so that the liberated war worlders will have their own chance to make their own memories and their own connections now that they're finally free of Mongol. Of course, when you're Superman, things can't ever be easy for long, can they? Clark gets called away from Earth when he feels a strange energy signature that just so happens to be situated around the zoo. It seems that it's a boom tube which brings with it three very famous as new gods. There's Desaad the Torturer, as well as the two sons of Darkseid, Kalabak and Orion, which is of course strange because Orion usually fights against the other two, meaning that what's ever brought them to planet Earth right now is big enough that they were willing to put their many, many differences aside. Bibbo, in classic lovable lunkhead fashion, decides to stand up to Kalabak, saying, Hey, I don't know what your business is here, but unless you got twenty two fifty for a ticket, I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. And then he actually swings on the new god, too. It's a good thing that Superman shows up at that very moment and saves Bibbo from probably breaking every bone in his body. It would seem that this contingent of new gods, which eventually goes on to include Metron as well, have come here to Earth today because of Superman, not because of who he is, but because what he did on Warworld, namely awakening Olgrim's fire. Olgrim is, of course, an old god. In fact, according to Philip Kennedy Johnson in this series, he's the oldest god of them all whose incredible power and eventual legendary madness still actually terrify the new gods to this day. We're also reminded that Olgrim's fire is just one of his many aspects, and that if some person was able to unite all of them together, Olgrim could basically be reborn again, or the person trying to gain all those powers could lose themselves to Olgrim's famous madness. Orion and the others fear that Superman has already lost his mind to Olgrim's fire, and that they need to stop him now, lest the universe as they know it be destroyed. Wow, they're really not giving Superman the benefit of the doubt on anything right now, are they? The Man of Steel is quick to explain, yeah, I got Olgrim's fire, but I didn't keep it. I used it to try and resurrect the boy over there. Which in turn only pisses them off more. You would put that amazing power in the body of a child? If that is
is true, then Ossol is now the heir of Olgrim, a god like us, and he's going to be coming with us now where we can better keep an eye on him. And no, the irony is not lost on Superman either that Orion is being a massive hypocrite right now, threatening to steal away a child from the only home and family he's ever known, much like how he was stolen away and given to High Father to make peace amongst the warring new gods. Obviously, Superman's not going to give the kid up, but what is particularly interesting about this scene is that Superman has himself a little flashback to the day that young John was taken from him by Mr. Oz. Superman stood by and did nothing back then because, well, Bendis kind of wrote him like a dumbass, but here, though, Superman refuses to let history repeat itself and as such steps on in to protect our soul, even if it means fighting the new gods. Don't you worry, little buddy, no one's gonna artificially age you up via wormhole shenanigans. Not again, never again. Word of Superman's battle against these alien gods travel fast, and as the comic comes to a close, we're once again at Stryker's Island, where we see that Metallo's sister missed their meeting. Meaning that Luthor probably made good on his threat, and it looks like Metallo, against his will, is going to have to go along with Luthor's plan. And so that was Action Comics number 1048, everybody, and once again, I'm really enjoying what Philip Kennedy Johnson is doing here. I love the Superman family of supporting characters really coming into focus, something we know is only going to get stronger in the next creative era of Superman, where an action comic looks to basically becoming a team book. There's a lot of great characterization to go around. This is probably the most interesting, extra-dimensional, and multi-layered that Metallo has been in a very long time. Johnson clearly has big plans for the twins, and he also clearly has been listening to the fan base and knows how upset they are about Bendis' time on the book. But instead of just ignoring those controversial creative choices and pretending like they didn't happen, Johnson is actually making it the backbone of the drama in his Superman story, and I gotta say that's pretty damn ballsy. Overall, I think I'd feel comfortable giving this one another 8 out of 10. Damn, it is a good time to be reading Superman books, I tell ya. Hey there, everyone. Kate Joel again, and I just want to thank you so much for watching to the end of the video. It means a lot to me. And hey, if you enjoyed the book I covered in this issue and want some comics of your own, might I recommend Book Depository? It's my number one place for shopping for comic book trades. You get a great price, and if you use my link down in the description, you'll actually be helping me out at the same time. You get something, I get something, everybody wins, right? So until next time, everyone, I've been Joel, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.